All right. What we'd like to do now is we'd like to go to Titus. Titus. Titus is in the New Testament. It's after First and Second Timothy. Okay. Titus chapter two. Titus chapter two in your Bible, if you'd like to get there. Titus chapter two, and it is Communion Sunday. Uh, so uh, certain things are on my mind when it's uh, when it's Communion Sunday, and I'd like to share that with you. Uh, Titus chapter two. Um, Titus. Titus was one of the Apostle Paul's. Uh, uh, fellow uh, ministers, helpers, and uh, and the Apostle Paul had left uh, uh, Titus in on the island of Crete to minister there. There were people that had gotten saved and started New Testament church there, and actually Titus is the pastor of that church, and the Apostle Paul is writing Titus, okay, that little book there, his name, chapters 1, 2, and 3, and to help him out as he as he has church ministry to the Cretan uh, believers on the island, and uh, and uh, it was a, probably a, a unique ministry. Although people are the same, but people are different too. You understand that, and kind of unique ministry because I I always uh, think about this, and uh, uh, you know, because God saves all kinds of people, right? Even Cretan people back there during the time of the Apostle Paul. And it's interesting what the Apostle Paul said about the Cretan, uh, these people on the island of Crete that are getting saved and what they're coming out of, what, where, they're, where they're coming from. It's not where they wind up, uh, where they should be, but it's where they're coming from and what he's working with. Not, not all of them are like what's described here, but but the general, the general atmosphere, attitude, this is how these people are. This is how, how the people on this island live is found in chapter 1, chapter 1, and verse 12. And one of themselves, a person that lives on Crete, and one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said this, the Christians are always, not Christians, Christians are always, always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. In other words, you're just stinking lazy to all oh, get out, man, you know. And verse 13, he said, I'm telling you, Titus, this witness is true. It's true what the guy said, what he said about them. And then he said, listen, you're going to have to handle some things. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. And I said, wow, what a ministry, huh? To a bunch of people like that. And I'm glad I don't have that issue. Amen. I, do, I don't, you know, so praise God for that. That is wonderful. But I'm going to read chapter two. You said, good thing, because I was wondering where you're going to go with that. You know, yikes. Okay. But anyway, okay. But you understand this is a ministerial letter. You understand this, okay? And 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 what 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 Apostle Paul wanted to help Titus with with the people of the island, okay? So he just told them honestly, you know, this is what they're like. This one of their own even says this, you know, and it's true. This is how they are. So this is what you're going to deal with, you know. But God changes people, Amen. You know, He changes them. You know, and it's it's not not just new life. It's a new way of living life. So. Anyway, listen to chapter 2, and I'm going to park on verse 11. The chapter goes very quickly as you read it. So, so he's telling Titus, he says, Speak thou of the things that become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior. See, because this was not the norm. What, what's being described here is not the norm. The norm was what's in chapter 1. He said, but we're going, to, we're going to work on these people. We're going to bring them along in Christ. The aged women, verse 3, likewise that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Listen, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands. Ouch. That the word of God may, be, may not be blasphemed, Verse 6, those young men, the young men likewise, exhort to be sober-minded. Get serious about life. Circumspect would be another word that's in the Bible, you know. But anyway, 
verse 7. In all things, he says, to, to Titus, showing thyself, even yourself, a pattern of good works and doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, and sincerity. Because they, they need an example, these people. Then he says, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say to you of you. Exhort servants to be obedient to their own masters and to please them well in all things, not, answer, uh, not answering again. In other words, not talking back and like threatening them and giving them grief and muttering and complaining and shouting and screaming, not prolorning, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. In other words, even if you wind up being a servant or a slave, if that's where you're at, listen, do it as unto Christ. Do it in a, in a proper fashion. God will honor you for that. It's a good testimony. He said, why are you going to do all these things? Why, why are you going to teach these things to these people? Why are you going to go ahead and do these things even in your own life, in your ministry? He says, because the grace of God, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Teaching us that denying ungodliness, verse 12, ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And while we're doing that, we want to be looking, verse 13, for that blessed hope. See, even then, back then, Apostle Paul said, look for the Lord's return, we're looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we have the right Jesus Christ, and we can identify him. He's the one, verse 14, who gave himself for us. That, that's the one we're looking for. The one who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, that's you and me, zealous of good works. He said, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority, a pastoral authority, and let no man despise thee. Verse 11, I like what he says, for the grace of God that hath appeared, okay, excuse me, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Lord, we'd ask your blessing upon the word of God that we've read, and we pray that you'd help us to be attentive and receptive now to what you have for us from your word this morning. Uh, may you help us, Holy Spirit, to get what God has for us. And we pray your blessing, what takes place, and may it find uh, something here that we can hold on to for a little while and be appreciative of, be able to work in our lives, maybe take it to be a witness to somebody else, and uh, to, to be grateful Christians as we head into this year, this new year, 2024. May a blessing rest upon us now, though, Lord, in sermon time. We're thankful for what we've experienced already. We pray that we will take something from this time together today and be able to uh, uh, utilize it in our lives for good, right, maybe even the blessing of somebody else. In your name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Okay. Now, as I read verse 11, as I read verse 11, let me read it one more time. Okay, as I read verse 11, and it's one of these things, it's, it, i got to flip my Bible, you know, it's, it's the end of the page. It says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. As I read verse number 11, my mind traveled to a hymn, to a hymn uh, uh, that you used to hear a lot of. Okay, uh, you know, through the years of my my Christianity, you know, I'm almost seventy. You know, I'm a I'm a baby though, right? I'm still I'm, I'm young. I say, you know, it, it came to my mind, and and it's in our hymnal, isn't it? The wonderful grace of Jesus, isn't that in our hymnal somewhere? I, I think it is, isn't it? Yeah, wonderful grace of Jesus. Let me tell you about 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 that hymn for a couple of minutes. Okay, the wonderful grace of Jesus. Uh, the author <coughs> is is Norwegian. His name is Haldor Lolinus, was born in Norway in 1855. Now, he lived a long time, and he's seen a lot of things, because he didn't die till 1959, okay, which is pretty good, pretty good run, don't you think? Hey, that's like 104 years old, man, that's, that's pretty good, isn't it, you know? So he's seen a, a lot of things. You know, even though he was in Norway for a while, you know, growing up, but, you know, you're talking about the Civil War. You're talking about the First World War, the Second World War. You're talking about the Korean War. Here we're at war again, you know, my goodness, you know. Witnessed all that, but all that technology, you think, you know, from walking or horse and buggy to now, you know, you know 
motor vehicles and all it's amazing electricity you know running water no outhouses anymore hey you know it's just it's, it's amazing but it says his family immigrated to America when he was a young child. He was trained at Dietz Pacific Bible College in Los Angeles and became a pastor in the Church of the Nazarene. He received his musical training through personal study and correspondence courses. Eventually, Lelinus uh, would obtain more renown through his musical endeavors than through his pastoral ministry. In 1925, while pastor of the First Church of the Nazarene in Indianapolis, he founded the Linus uh, uh, Publishing Company, which was later, later purchased by the Nazarene Publishing House and became its music division. Over his lifetime, he wrote more than 4,000 hymn texts and tunes, many of which are still in use today by both the Nazarene and by other denominations. Now, I'm going to stop there because when, you, when we look at this song, this hymn that he wrote, okay, and... Uh, uh, the wonderful grace of, of Jesus, uh, it doesn't quite line up with his Nazarene doctrines, but he stayed true to the Bible. Because Nazarenes believe you can have complete sanctification in this life. And they also believe that you can lose your salvation if you're not careful. And you can, if you fall away into apostasy and you stay there, we don't, we, uh, you know, like everybody that can lose your salvation, we don't know how bad you have to be to lose it, but they believe you can lose it, you can lose your eternal security. And so, but that's not how the song he penned goes. He stayed biblical when he talked about uh, uh, the wonderful grace of Jesus. So that's a little bit about him. Now I have to tell you this, before we look at the song and, and think about our scripture again, that verse 11 out of Titus chapter two, you have to understand this, and, and, and I don't mean to sound mean or like, 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 yeah, today I'm kind of like, yeah. Listen, you know, if it wasn't for God's mercy, there would not be a man around to ever experience, ever experience the appearance of God's grace that brings salvation if it wasn't for God's mercy. The fact of the matter is that you weren't like, like dead already and in hell already. That's God's mercy. God allowed you to live. That's his mercy. So you could, what? Hear of the grace of God that's appeared to all men and learn of the grace of God and what that means in Jesus Christ. So the idea, you know about mercy. Mercy is not, you're not receiving what you really deserve. Grace is what? Receiving what you don't deserve. You understand? And so listen, we think about the grace of God, but I also, and I understand in the New Testament because of the grace of God, because about faith in Christ and all those kind of things, because we're trying to get away from the law thing that was in the Old Testament, I realize that. But I'll tell you what, the mercy of God, the Bible says is, is everlasting. The mercies of God are new every morning. Amen? The mercies of God. God is merciful. God allowed me to walk and live in my sin and be in defiance of him. And, and God allowed me. That I was an enemy before I was a child of God. I was an enemy of God. That's what the Bible teaches about every one of us that's lost. We're in opposition to God. We're his enemy. Even though he loves us and cares about us, God was merciful to us and allowed me to live in my defiance, in my arrogance, in my ignorance, in my stupidity. Okay? So, so one day I could realize how wonderful the grace of God is. It appeared to all men, including me, the wonderful grace of Jesus. So I'm thankful for the mercy, too. And I know you know about Jesus. You know Jesus, you know, embodied that grace and truth. You, you know that. But I, I'm grateful for God's mercy, too. But we're going to talk about grace. It says, for now, we want to talk about grace, the grace of God. It's the grace of God that brings salvation, it says in our text verse, verse 11. This message is embodied in the God-man who is full of grace and truth. And I like that, full. He's full of grace and truth, okay? He contains all of God's, if we could say, wait, God's grace and truth, the God-man Jesus Christ. 
Now, as we make, as we make a few observations, let me get, put my, as we make a few observations about the hymn, we are going to recognize what I'm saying to you because you've heard it before, what I'm going to say. You've heard it before. You'll recognize this. You've heard it before, not that I preached this sermon before, but you've heard this before. It's the old, old story of Jesus and his love. It is the story, though, that never grows old. It never grows old. It should be, it should be a, a beautiful song of, of harmony and joy and happiness and gratitude to our ears. It's the old, old story of Jesus and his love. It is the story that never grows old, how Jesus died to save my soul, save your soul. Now, it's interesting what it says in verse 1 of the song, verse 1 of the song. I want to, I want to read you just the first line of the first verse. It says, wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. My sin. Okay. So I'm going to flip the coin, and let's talk about your sin. You say, well, Pastor, why don't you talk about your own sin? Yeah, but you understand, I'm preaching, and I got the pulpit. No, I'm kidding. Listen, I want to talk about your sin, your sin. It's greater than my sin, too. The, the grace, the wonderful grace of Jesus is greater than all my sin. Let's talk about your sin. As you sit here today, we're going to talk about your sin. As you sit here today, all cleaned up, all cleaned up, man. You look great, you know. I don't need my glasses to see you all clean up, you know. And if you throw, you know, you, you drop your Bible on the floor, you throw that candy wrapper on the floor, I know, I can see what you're doing. Just because I need these to read doesn't mean I can't see what's going on, you know. Listen, as you see, we're going to talk about your sin. As you sit here today, all cleaned up, you look absolutely fabulous, beaming with angelic glow. And even though you have no wings or you don't have a halo, listen. Thank the Lord that none of you look like any of those naked, cherub, baby angels that adorn the Sistine Chapel. And, you know, I'm glad about that too. Because I don't want to look like one of those little naked fat baby angels, do you? I don't want to do that. You know? uh, they are bald, more or less. So I have something, but I don't think they have a beard. Do they have beards? Do they? I don't think they have beards. You know, do they have wings? I don't even know they have wings. You know, I should have, I, I read up on Mac, Michelangelo. You know, he's the one that did that. You know, did all that painting, you know, and it's just, yeah. I think he was working out his anxieties. Like, you know, he had to just keep doing something, you know. It's incredible what he did, you know. He's just like incredible uh, ability, talent, unbelievable. But uh, listen, your sin's a big deal with God. Your sin, now if I was a, a, a pastor that had a, a, a a, a, a well-rounded vocabulary I'd be able to, you know, elaborate. But I'm just going to say, your sin is a big deal with God. You know why? Because we're accountable to God for our lives and how we live and how we are, what we do, what we say. We're accountable to God. And we're accountable to God who is holy and righteous and just and pure, sinless, besides being loving and kind and merciful and gracious, but but he's got these other things here too, who he is, how he is. So your sin's a big deal with God. And your sin debt, you know, when you sin, you not only sin against whomever it might be, but you sin against an eternal God. You, you strike up, you know, some eternal debt is adding up. Somebody's got to pay the debt because God lives eternally. And you're accountable to him and responsible to him. And because, because he's moral, and he's just, you know, he, he's, he keeps the books, if we want to say it that way. Not because he's mean, but because in his character, he's pure and he's righteous and he's just, and he has to somehow balance the books about this, this sin that you keep accumulating. Against who? Ultimately, against him. So your sin debt is beyond your ability to pay back, even if you worked at it for the next thousand years. Okay. That's the fact of the matter. 
Because you understand that you have to be perfect, and there's none righteous, no, not one. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know all those verses. You know? And about this, all this thing about your sin, I'm going to tell you what, you know, and some people would disagree with these kind of things, but that's up to them. That's their business. I know what the Bible says, and I know where God stands, and I know what the Lord did for me. But listen, I'll tell you what, your burden, the burden about sin, and that sin that your burden is heavy. Jesus said, if you come to me, your burden will be light. My burden's light. But, but, but people with the sin debt hanging over their head, listen, that, that is heavy. The burden, the sin burden is heavy. It's heavy now. It's heavy now. And will only grow exponentially the longer you live. Because for whatever the reason, even the best of us, can be like the worst of us. We just can't seem to quit <laughs> any funny. We just can't seem to quit sinning. But you say, but you say, wait a minute, Pastor, I, I heard what you said, but wait a minute, wait a minute, my sin, is, my sin isn't near as bad as his sin or her sin or their sin, and that may be true. I'll give you that. It, it could be true. You know, I understand that. But you know all sin is sin. You know that. All sin is sin. However, not all sin is the same. Some is worse. That's right. Even God looks at it that way. That's right. Listen, you know not but all sin is sin, but not all sin is the same in content. It's not the same in consequences. And, and eternally, God does, God, it's not the same. There's categories for sin and how God judges sin at the great white throne judgment eventually. And some people are going to experience more of hell than some other people. And that way, God certainly will be just. Okay. As he judges those that owe the sin debt to God for almighty he's almighty he's holy he's righteous he's just he's a just judge in God however though about sin regardless of where it lands in in its its content okay and its consequences and whatever category you 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 put it into uh, uh even if it's the lighter sins or not so bad sins, it could because it's still sin, it all, all of it will condemn you instead of commend you to God. All of it will. However, there is hope. Amen? There's hope. Okay? There's hope. The hope is the wonderful grace of Jesus, like the song says, and it's true, it's biblical. The wonderful grace of Jesus is greater than all, all, all my sin. Now, if you want to dance in the aisle, do it now. You want to stand on the pew, careful, careful, okay? And you want to shout hallelujah and try to hang from the light, go ahead. You just want to be a reserved Baptist and uh, you take your King James Bible and just stand up and just thump that baby. You're a Bible thumper. You're a King James lover. And this is great. I have hope because of the wonderful grace of Jesus. Amen. amen. All right. That sounds like half of a Presbyterian Methodist type of amen. But we'll, we'll, t we'll take anything. We'll take anything. Won't we? That's astounding. It's greater than all my sin. All my sin. And this being the case then, like the rest of that verse says, this being the case, it's greater than all my sin, how shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise begin? Taking away my burden, my burden, take, taking it away, taking away my burden, setting my spirit free for the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches not him and not her and not them for this. The wonderful grace of Jesus reaches 
me. Me. It's me. 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 The first line of the second verse. Now, I'm not going to be near as long, and I realize we have communion. Listen, the first line of the second verse, listen to what it says. Wonderful grace of Jesus reaching to all the lost. All the lost. All the lost. Even the people you think are a lost cause. Maybe you were a lost cause. Okay? Wonderful grace of Jesus reaching to all the lost. Who is lost? All were lost. All of us are lost without the wonderful grace of Jesus. All of us. All. All does not mean few. All does not mean some. All does not mean many. And all does not mean most. Here, all means all. It's just like this. He ate all of that jelly donut. Can you believe that? He ate it all. You understand all. She, she burned all, all of his old love letters, but kept his picture. No, I'm kidding. Now, he, listen, she burned all, she told you, she told you she had enough of that guy. And realized, you know, this ain't going to work. So she burned all his old love letters. And you know her, all means she burned them all, man. You know, but she saved his picture. Lest you've forgotten also, you know, George Strait, he was country, he's still around, country music singer, right? Country western music singer. You know about that song. You know, he's had that song. He said, all my exes live in <laughs> Texas. You know, all means he meant all of them, not some of them. Man, yikes. It says the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches all the lost. Seems to me what verse 11 of our text says to us. Okay. Okay. That God's grace, you know, salvation's grace has appeared unto all men. Does all mean all? It means all. It means the worst of us. To the best of us. To the people we think are lost cause and would never, ever become a Christian. It even is extended to them. Salvation grace is to and for everyone. And it has even reached me. Because I was lost too. You know, if we can put it in the context for you, you were, you were wandering away in darkness of sin. But along the way, let's make it simple. But you saw the what? You saw the light. Yeah, you saw the light. And this being the case, ah, let me get my glasses on. We can, we can take note of the rest of that verse. Wonderful grace of Jesus reaching to all the lost. By it, I, by it I have been pardoned, saved to the uttermost. If I'm saved to the uttermost, you know, you can't lose your salvation. You lose your salvation. But anyway. Chains have been torn asunder, giving me liberty in Christ. Liberty, freedom finally for the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches not just him and not just her, but me. Me. And last of all, the beginning of verse number three of this psalm. It says about the wonderful grace of Jesus. May I kind of touched on this already, but that's okay. The wonderful grace of Jesus reaching the most defiled. Defiled. Most of us, if not all of us, don't think that we were ever the worst of us. Should I say it again? It's true. It's true. Most of us, if not all of us, don't think we were ever the worst of us. And sometimes we wonder, how can it ever be that the Lord reaches the bad sinners, the really bad ones? Why do you bother with them? It can reach the, the, the really bad sinners, those really wicked people, and those no good, evil, evil people, just evil to the bone, man, evil. They're satanic, sadistic. 
uh, uh, they're molesters, murderers, maniacal deviants. Then two? Yes, them too. We recoil at that, like almost, like it, but the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches even the most defiled. That's why it's wonderful. That's why the grace is wonderful. It reaches everyone. So it stands to reason that the wonderful grace of Jesus is able to save any one of them. Any one of them. You guys want to come up? Okay. Any one of them. That being the case, I'm hurried along. I'd like to park here, but that being the case, okay, okay, we can read this. By its transforming power, making him God's dear child, purchasing peace and heaven for all eternity, and the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Don't you like this? I, I like this. I, it's just, this is good stuff. I, I know it's the same old story. It's the old story about Jesus and his love. I understand that, but this is good. We need to hear this sometimes. Okay. And that's true because 1 John chapter 2, verse 2 tells us that, 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 that Jesus Christ was a propitiation for our sins, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Christian sins, because 1 John was written to Christians. Okay. And it says, but not for ours only, but for the sins of the world. Talking about the world of humanity. So that includes even the most defiled. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that wonderful? You know? Don't ever assume anything about somebody. Just don't. They're not them. They'll never get saved. That ain't going to happen. Hey, you know that. Don't be like that. You know why? Because you won't witness anybody. You'll size them up and have some excuse why not to do anything. Now, why not to ever approach them about Christ? Don't do that. You might have family members like that. Don't be like that. No. So all that being the case, and we need to close because we have communion this, this Sunday morning. All this being the case, I can, I can share the chorus with you once. You know, and that's where all the parts come in and everybody sings the different parts. You know, wonderful, the matchless grace of Jesus. Yeah, we can get a glimpse of that today. Yeah, we could say that, yeah. Deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even, uh, wave your flag and cheer, even me. It says all sufficient grace for even me, broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater than, far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise his name. Let's sing.